Well, we'll just start Act 5, Scene 3. Okay? We, we left off with Vernon telling Hotspur um, about Harry slash Hal, Prince of Wales's challenge. And, I mean, the way Vernon described it is like he, he was almost ready to switch sides, you know, because Hal was, one, so humble, and two, so praising of Hotspur. So Hotspur says, Cousin, I think thou art enamored of his follies. Okay? Never did I hear of any prince so wild a liberty. What's he mean by that? So wild a liberty. Well, your boss tells you licentiousness. I've never heard of a more debauched, more gross, more <clears throat> profane prince, etc. But if he wants to fight me, he'll fight me. Okay? So, Act 5, Scene 3. King enters with his power. Notice passes over the stage. There is an alarm to the battle. Douglas enters one side. Blunt enters the other side. They're not following each other, you know, onto the stage. And Blunt is dressed like the king. And he asks, who are you? Who dares cross me in battle? And he says, my name is Douglas. I do haunt thee in battle. Thus, because some tell me thou art the king, they tell thee true. Notice Blunt doesn't go, no, 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 I'm not the king. I'm merely pretending to be the king. Why? Why does he say, yep? They told you true. I am the king. Why is he dressed as the king? Distraction? Why else? <coughs> Protect the king. Okay. Then the Lord of Stafford, dear today, hath bought thy likeness. For instead of thee, King Harry, this sword hath ended him. Notice. Blunt's not the only one impersonating the king. J.K. Rowling takes this idea, by the way, in the seventh Harry Potter novel. So, unless you yield as my prisoner. Kings don't yield as prisoners. Or they shouldn't, I guess. Blunt, I was not born a yielder, he says, and I'm going to revenge Stafford's death. They fight, and Douglas kills Blunt. Hotspur comes in. Okay? And he says, if you fought like that at Holden, I never would have defeated you. He says, oh, well. All's one. He thinks the battle is over. I've killed the king. They will lose their will to fight. Hotspur, where? That is, where's the king? Here. No, that's not the king. That's Blunt. <laughs> Looks like the king, but it's not him. Notice the Douglas has never met the king before. Hotspur's been in the king's presence many times. Okay. He says, but why did he tell me he was the king? Hotspur, 25. The king hath many marching in his coats. So there are more than just Stafford and Blunt pretending to be the king. Well, I will kill all his coats then. Okay. Falstaff comes in after Hotspur and Douglas leave. Though I could scape shot free at London, I fear the shot here. Here's no scoring but upon the page. And he sees Blunt's body. There's honor for you. Remember his previous speech about honor? That's what honor gets you. Here's no vanity. Why? Because you can't be vain when you're a dead man. You also can't pretend when you're a dead man. I am as hot as molten lead and as heavy too. As hot as molten lead... He's talking about sweating profusely. Keep in mind, he's grossly overweight. Grossly overweight isn't 250, 300 pounds. He's like 450, 500 pounds. God keep lead out of me. I need no more weight than my own bowels. I have led my ragamuffins where they are peppered. His men are all dead. Okay? There's not three of my hundred and fifty left alive. 
and they are for the town's end to beg during life. That probably indicates those three, they're wounded. They will be crippled or maimed for the rest of their lives. And the prince comes in. What, stands thou idle here? Idle, he's not doing anything. Lend me thy sword. Why? Because Hal's lost his in the battle. Okay? Lend me thy sword. I pray thee, Hal, give me, prince, Hal, give me leave to breathe a while, etc. Okay? I paid Percy, I made him sure. He is indeed living to kill thee. Lend me thy sword. He says, I don't have my sword, but take my pistol. And he reaches into what would essentially be a holster, and he pulls out what looks kind of like this. A water skein. But it's not water. It's cork. He's got a sack in there. It's booze. In what should be a pistol. Is it a time to jest and dally now? How's implying? There is a time for jesting. There is a time for dallying, for playing. This isn't it. Okay? It's kind of the old Ecclesiastes. To every time there is a season. Wrong season. He throws the bottle. Well, if Percy be alive, I'll pierce him. If, if he do come in my way, so, that is, if he comes in my way, if he do not, if I come in his willingly, let him make a carbonado of me. In other words, if I accidentally come into Percy's way, well, then he's going to kill me. Falstaff's telling me, telling us, I'm not going to find Percy. I'm not going to go look for him. 5-4. The king comes in. And he says, I pray thee, Harry, withdraw thyself. Thou bleedest too much. Hal is wounded? Or is this blood from everybody else? Lancaster. Not I, my lord, unless I bleed too. Okay? Because he tells John of Lancaster, Hal's younger brother, go with him. Make sure your older brother is safe. Why? Future, Future king. Okay? Hal, I beseech your majesty, make up, lest your retirement do amaze your friends. Okay? Make up. Go forward. Don't retreat. If you retreat your retirement, okay, it will do what? Amaze your friends. Your gloss tells you alarm. I will do so. Okay? He tells Westmoreland, lead him, Hal, to his tent. By the way, that St. Christmas Day speech that I talked about, Westmoreland's there too. In fact, it's Westmoreland's comments that prompt King Harry, now, to deliver this great speech. How? Lead me, my lord? Because Westmoreland says, let me lead you to your tent. No, 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 I don't need your help. God forbid a shallow scratch should drive the Prince of Wales from such a field as this. In other words, they're just flesh wounds. Okay? So, John Lancaster and Westmoreland leave. And the prince looks at his brother as he's leaving. By God, hast thou deceived me, Lancaster. I did not think thee, Lord, of such a spirit. Before I loved thee as a brother, John, but now I do respect thee as my soul. Okay? John is just in his mid to late teens. Hal is in his late teens, early 20s at this point. Okay? And the king says, I saw him hold Lord Percy at the point. Douglas comes in. Another king? Really? You know, are you the real one? Or the king says, No, I'm the king. Who Douglas grieves at heart so many of his shadows thou hast met, and not the very king. I have two boys. Seek Percy and thyself uh, about the field. That is, my two sons are looking for Percy and you. But seeing thou falls on me, so luckily I will essay thee and defend myself. They fight. The king is in danger. Hal comes in, saves his father's life. Why is that important? 
because early on in Henry IV, part two, the king's going to wonder if Hal really wants him alive. Okay? So, Douglas flees. The king says, Thou hast redeemed, line 48, thy lost opinion. Lost opinion? What I used to think of you. And show thou make some tender of my life in this fair rescue thou hast brought to me. O oh God, they did me too much injury that ever said, I hearkened for your death. How tells us there. Somebody previously said, he doesn't really care whether you live or not. If it were so, that is, if I did hearken for your death, I could have let the Douglas kill you. Which would have been as speedy in your end as all the poisonous potions in the world. So, Hotspur comes in. King leaves, Hotspur comes in. If my mistake's not dour, Harry Monmouth. Notice he doesn't call him Prince of Wales. Monmouth is in Wales, by the way. Harry, <laughs> you act like I would deny my name. Why then I see a very valiant, excuse me, Hotspur, my name is Harry Percy. Why then I see a very valiant rebel of the name. He doesn't call him a coward. He says, nope, you're valiant, but you are a rebel. I am the Prince of Wales. In other words, next time you, you know, see me and call me something, it's your highness, by the way. And think not, Percy, to share with me in glory any Share? What's, how, how's, how's glory been apportioned between the two so far in the play? If, if this were a balance or scale, where's Harry's, where's Hotspur's? Take in mind, the glory would weigh the most. Hotspur would be like this. How would be up here? Because he has none. Yeah, he'd be an inglorious, not bastard, because he's not, but you know, you get the idea. So, Two stars keep not their motion in one sphere. Here's a sphere. Well, why can't there be two stars in it? What idea is Shakespeare introducing here? He's actually introduced it earlier. What conception of the universe is this? Modern scientific word, it's the geocentric. Old-fashioned word, after... Ptolemy, Greek astronomer, it's the Ptolemaic view of the universe, which is what? You have Earth at the center, and at that, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine concentric spheres. So think of the Earth as a ball, and then a glass ball around that, a larger glass ball, a larger glass ball, all the way out. Each of these nine concentric spheres also is thought spiritually to have a ruling intelligence. Okay? But each of the nine spheres has a star or some kind of guiding principle for it. That's why a sphere can't have two stars. Because they would be bound to oppose each other. Two stars keep not their motion in one sphere, nor can one England brook a double reign of Harry Percy and the Prince of Wales. We can't both be alive. In other words, England's not big enough for the two of us. Nor shall it, Harry, for the hour has come to end the one of us, and would to God thy name in arms were as great as mine. Too bad for you, I'm known as the better warrior. Thy what in arms? Name. What's he talking about? It's an idea, you know, rampant in our political discussions today. Your reputation. Well, what is reputation? Seemingly, I'm not going to get sidetracked. What is reputation seemingly based upon? Title? It's based upon your actions. So what have we seen of Hal's actions? Not a lot. Percy's? He defeated the greatest warrior alive. <laughs> Douglas. 
I'll make it greater ere I part from thee, and all the budding honors on thy crest I'll crop to make a garland for my head. Budding honors. Notice what Hal says there. They're buds. They haven't what? They haven't opened up. They haven't reached full flower. He says, so I'm going to cut those little buds of honor off your head, and I'm going to make a garland to crown my head. I can no longer brook thy vanities. A uh, fancy way of saying, put up or shut up. And they fight. Falstaff comes in. And notice, does Falstaff, you know, while Harry's battling him in the front, does Falstaff come in the back and uh, run him through? No. He stands back to her, go get him, Hal. Douglas comes in, fights with Falstaff, who falls down as if he were dead. Douglas leaves. And the prince killeth Percy. That's a stage direction. Okay? Oh, Harry, thou hast robbed me of my youth. I better brook the loss of brittle life than those proud titles thou hast won of me. I don't care for honor, Hotspur is saying. I care that I'm dying. They wound my thoughts worse than thy sword. Excuse me. Other way around. They wound my thoughts worse than thy sword my flesh, but thoughts the slaves of life and life times fool. And there is one of the major themes throughout Shakespeare. Life is times fool. That is, life is the thing time plays with, like a cat with a mouse. And time that takes survey of all the world must have a stop. And he says, no, Percy, thou art dust and food for, oh, and he dies. Food for what? Q. Hamlet. <laughs> Act 5, scene 1, gravedigger scene. Food for worms. That's what honor gets you. I mean, this theme runs almost from the beginning of Shakespeare to the end. What's the purpose of life? For us to fatten worms, that's it, to die. Prince, for worms, brave Percy, he finishes the speech. Fear thee well, great heart, ill-weaved ambition, how much art thou shrunk. Notice, what kind of ambition? Ill-weaved. Shakespeare isn't saying all ambition is bad. Improper ambition. What ambition did Hotspur possibly have? The monarchy. Okay. When that this body did contain a spirit, a kingdom for it was too small a bound. Again, I'm going to go back, not back, forward, because we haven't discussed it yet, to Hamlet. Hamlet tells his two friends, I could be a king of infinite space, bounded in a nutshell. Okay. Put me in a walnut shell. He says that I would count myself a king of infinite space, were it not for I have bad dreams. This body, he says, contains a spirit. The body was a kingdom, but the body was too small for your spirit. But now two paces of the vilest earth is room enough. Six feet. This earth that bears thee dead bears not alive so stout a gentleman. Is Harry going, and you got what you deserve, you dirty, rotten rebel. I'm going to bury you in an unmarked grave. No. He does, he shows what? Old medieval renaissance notion. I can remember how to spell it. Noblesse oblige. The honor due to an honorable opponent, even though dead. Okay. If thou wert sensible of courtesy, I should not make so show so dear a show of zeal. But let my favors hide thy mangled face. And so what does he do? 
He pulls out a scarf or some other favor, a handkerchief. It's something with his heraldic emblem on it. And he covers his face. Do and take thy praise with thee to heaven. Thy ignominy sleep with thee in the grave. Julius Caesar, Mark Antony's speech, says, The good that men often do is interred with them. Something to the effect of, but their evil deeds live on. Notice what Hal does here. He turns that around. Let your evil deeds die with you. In other words, let your name go on, your reputation go on in honor. Let Hotspur be remembered for his good qualities. Okay. So he says, he sees Falstaff, he thinks he's dead. Could not all this flesh keep in a little life? Notice the difference in comparison with Hotspur. Hotspur had too little flesh to keep in such a big life. Such an amazing soul. Falstaff has too much flesh to keep in such a poor soul. Poor Jack. I could have spared, better spared, a better man. I should have heavy miss of thee. Notice the punning there. If I were much in love with vanity. Vanity. Foolishness. He is saying. Look at that again. I should have a heavy miss of thee if I were much in love with vanity. Should have. That's a conditional. But he's not in love with vanity. Okay? So he's not going to have a great miss of false stuff. He leaves and Falstaff rises, you know. And what does Falstaff do? It's despicable. He stabs Hotspur. He stabs Hotspur. Why? Take credit? Why else? What does Falstaff say? He gives us another reason. Well, maybe, maybe Hotspur's like me. Maybe he's only mostly dead. Ugh! He's going to make sure. That's Falstaff lying. He knows Hotspur's dead. Okay? To die is to be a counterfeit, for he is but the counterfeit of a man who hath not the life of a man, right? Because when you're dead, it's why, you know, the gravedigger says to Hamlet, when Hamlet asks, you know, whose grave is this? Well, it's nobody's. Well, what do you mean? Is it man's or woman's? Neither. Well, she who was alive, that is to be buried, and he puns there on the meanings of words, like was and is, because those are both being verbs, right? But Ophelia is now dead, so she no longer is. Now there's just what? The carcass, okay? So, the carcass is a counterfeit, because he's no longer alive. The better part of valor is discretion, in which the better part I've saved my life. The better part of valor is discretion. It's knowing what? When to run away. That's what he means. He says, but I'm afraid of this gunpowder, Percy, though he be dead. The though he be dead is, is fa false staff acknowledging. I know he's dead. By my faith, I'm afraid he would prove the better counterfeit. Maybe he is only counterfeiting being dead. Therefore, I'll make him sure. And then I'll swear I killed him. Stolen valor? You know, Shakespeare is, no matter what you read of him, he is 
always applicable. He is always current. Okay. Why may not he rise as well as I? So, stabs Hotspur in the back. Okay. That has all kinds of resonant meaning, you know. To stab somebody, first of all, a warrior in the back when you're fighting him, that's not done. But to stab a dead person, I mean, that's even doubly low. So, Prince comes in with John of Lancaster, and he says, Lancaster, I thought you said the fat man was dead. I, I did. I saw him dead. Breathless, bleeding on the ground. Art thou alive? He said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm alive. And if your father will do me honor, so. Because notice, Falstaff's what? He's got Hotspur on his back. Why? <laughs> That's exactly it. Hotspur is his trophy. Look what I did, everybody. I killed Hotspur. And he throws the body down. He doesn't gently lie it down. If your father will do me honor, so if not, let him kill the next Percy himself. I killed Percy, Henry says. Harry says. Didst thou? Notice, I killed Percy and saw thee dead. Really? Did you? Not dead. Maybe you didn't really kill Percy. Maybe you only seriously wounded him. Okay? I'll take it upon my death. I gave him this wound in the thigh. If the man were alive and would deny it, sounds out and teeth like fine, whatever. Notice, Hal's not seeking glory, even though his comments to Percy, excuse me, suggested otherwise. So, for my part, if a lie may do thee grace, what's the lie? That you killed Hotspur. If that may do you some grace, if my father might benefit you in some way because of that, I'll gild it with the happiest terms I have. Gild it. I'll cover that lie with gold. It'll be the most beautiful lie in, in Tolkien's essay titled On Fairy Stories. He has a snippet of a poem in there that he wrote to a friend. And in that poem, he tells us that he wrote this poem to this friend because this friend said that all literature, all poetry, all myth, every kind of fictitious telling is nothing but lies breathed through silver. Think about that phrase for a minute. Lies, untruths, breathed through silver. They're silver-coated lies. In other words, they're beautiful. Right? Because there wasn't ever really a person named Hamlet who killed a person named Polonius. That's a lie. There was never a Zeus or Hera or Apollo or Mercury or Hermes or all lies. Beautiful lies. Okay? And Tolkien essentially said, no, that's not true. The friend, by the way, was C.S. Lewis before Tolkien helped him on his conversion to Christianity. Take my incidence course if I ever get offered again, and we'll talk about it. So, he says, I'll gild that lie. Falstaff is left, Prince of Wales and such leave. Falstaff exits bearing off the body. Notice, bearing, not the same as carrying. Carrying implies it's either in his arms or over his shoulder. Bearing could be dragging. And depending on your perspective of both Hotspur and Falstaff, you might direct that, you know, accordingly. So the king, 5-5, five, five, and then we'll get to part two. Thus ever did rebellion find rebuke. Thus ever implies what? Always. This is what always happens to rebellion. What's the problem with that statement? Yeah, his rebellion didn't end that way. Ill-spirited Worcester, did not we send grace, pardon, 
in terms of love to all of you. We gave you a chance. What were the terms that Henry told Worcester and Vernon to take to Hotspur? Tell us your grievances. If they have merit, I'll give you what you want. And all will be forgiven. I'll restore you to whatever off offices and such that are due you. And it'll be like, we just won't talk about this ever happening. Vernon, in that scene, when they go back to Hotspur, says what? To Worcester. Other way around. Worcester says we can't tell Hotspur. Why? He'll take the offer. Vernon says we ought to. Okay? They are in that scene. They become the embodiment of poor advisors. Advisors who don't tell their leader what that leader needs to know in order to make a wise decision. Okay? So, and wouldst thou turn our offers contrary? Misuse the tenor of thy kinsman's trust. Thy kinsman? Hotspurs. You misused him. You abused him by not telling him our offer, he's saying. Three knights upon our party slain today. Stafford, Blunt, and... We don't know who else. I don't think we're named who else on their side. Douglas is alive. A noble earl, many a creature else had been alive this hour, if, like a Christian, thou hadst truly borne betwixt our armies true intelligence. You acted unchristianly. Therefore, you're going to die. Worcester, what I have done, my safety urged me to. My safety. Not whose safety. Not Hotspur's safety. Who else? His men. Not his men's safety. Worcester is just like Falstaff. Does Falstaff care about his 150 men? Nope. Did Worcester care about Hotspur's men? Nope. He cared about his own safety. And I embrace this fortune patiently, since not to be avoided, it falls on me. I embrace this fortune. Why? Because I can't avoid it. That's the whole thing of making a virtue of necessity. If it's going to happen, you might as well just accept it. Bear Worcester to the death. Vernon too. Other offenders we will pause upon. That is, we'll deliberate. We'll think about what should happen to them. The king asked of Harry, how goes the field? The noble Scott, Lord Douglas, when he saw the fortune of the day quite turned from him, the noble Percy slain and all his men upon the foot of fear, fled with the rest and falling from a hill, he was so bruised that the pursuers took him. At my tent the Douglas is. And let me dispose of him. Now, dispose can mean what? It's yours. It's yours. Do what you want. And he tells his younger, younger brother, to you this honorable bounty shall belong. Notice, bounty, this great kind of like treasure. What's the bounty to be? Go to the Douglas and deliver him to his pleasure, ransomless and free. Free him. He doesn't have to pay anything for his freedom. What does this tell us about how? Okay. Okay. He could be no army, no pride of his own left. He's not the greatest warrior anymore because he's been defeated. So is mine. Okay. Plus, earlier we had the they won't drink team water anymore because it's poisoned. Duel with the Scots at Hotspur and I, so he's kind of learning he's kind of made mistakes. Okay. And what did you say? He could be merciful. He can be merciful. 
But he doesn't even charge a ransom. He doesn't make Douglas buy his freedom. So it's both of those and what else? There's a, there's a specific term that describes Hal's action here towards Douglas. Starts with an M. He's magnanimous to those in defeat. Does he have to show this kind of grace? This is unearned merit. Right? Specific theological term there. Unearned merit. Does he have to show this? No. Okay. At least two. He Blunt killed Stafford and Blunt. Uh, Douglas killed Stafford and Blunt. Right. Two of those three knights that the king spoke of. I mean, you could say his death is deserved, and Hal is saying, "Let him go." It's part of part of that. What's the effect of this? If he shows great magnanimity to Douglas, let me put it this way: What can the effect be? What may be a consequence of that? Could it be that Douglas is going, okay, then I'm going to come get him when I have my chance? That could be one consequence. What could be the other one? He becomes an ally. He becomes an ally. Real world example. Look at World War II and the aftermath of World War II. Compare World War II and its aftermath with World War I and its aftermath. World War I ended the German powers, the Axis powers essentially, even though that's a World War II phrase, was thoroughly defeated. And what did the winning side do to the losing side? Through the Treaty of Versailles and such. We took Germany's nose and proverbially rubbed it in the pile of crap and said, you got to pay us back to the last penny. Not a, not a good way to do that. What did we do at the, end, at the end of World War II? We, the United States, not the Allies, the United States, did what? Well, beginning in what year was it, 49? The Marshall Plan. Well, we demilitarized Germany as part of the end of the war, but what did we do in Germany? We rebuilt. What did we do to Japan? We rebuilt. The reason Japan was the economic power it was in the 60s, 70s, 80s, early 90s, and it hasn't been one really since then, is because of what we did. The United States showed great magnanimity, okay? And what did that do? to our two foremost enemies. It made Japan and West Germany, West Germany at the time, our two greatest allies. Yeah, I know Britain too, but you know, Britain was on our side, okay? So, his valor shown upon our crest today have taught us how to cherish, cherish such high deeds, even in the bosom of our adversaries. He's saying, he fought so well we should honor that. Yeah, even though he was our enemy. Lancaster, I thank your grace. Why? Prince of Wales. For this high courtesy. So, King, this is what remains. We have to divide our power. For what purpose? <coughs> is the battle, excuse me, is the war over? Mortimer's still out there. Mortimer's still out there. Where? Wales with Glendower, and Northumberland is still up there. They've won a skirmish. They've defeated the smallest okay, of the three armies, if you want, so to speak, of the rebellion. Okay. Now open second part of King Henry IV, or Henry IV Part Two, And how does it begin?
begins with rumor. Okay? Look at your <clears throat> induction. The location. Although the allegory of rumor, based ultimately on Virgil's depiction of fama, fame, is full of eyes, ears, and tongues in the Aeneid, it is timeless. Rumor is here represented as standing in front of Northumberland's Hall, Workworth. The play is supposed to open immediately after the Battle of Shrewsbury, in which Henry Percy Hotspur and the Scottish Earl Douglas have been overthrown. We're concerned here, first of all, with the news of the battle with which Henry IV ended. Okay? We know how Shrewsbury ended because we saw it. Okay? But now we're at Northumberland's Hall. Northumberland wasn't there. He didn't see it. He doesn't know how it ended. So we have this character, Rumor, come out and deliver this speech. Good speech. Great speech to memorize. Open your ears, for which of you will stop the vent of hearing when loud Rumor speaks? They have the same meaning for Rumor as we have today. What are, how are rumors, what are rumors? Louder. Untruth. Okay. They are untrue, unproven statements, accusations, charges, stories of fact. That is, they are given as fact, but they are not fact. So, who can stop your ears when you hear these kinds of rumors? Boy, I could get all political here. <laughs> I, from the Orient to the Drupal, what's the Orient? In the East. Orient literally means East. So, when you hear the phrase, I have to orient myself, literally, or something needs to be oriented. Literally means turn it. And face it east. Okay? So from the east to the west, what? I, making the wind my post horse, still unfold the axe, commence it on this ball of earth. How is rumor moving? It's like it's being carried on the wind. Somebody hears, overhears a conversation in a pub. They overhear it, which means... It's not clear. They don't hear all of it. And they then go to another pub and say what they over, and somebody overhears that. Upon my tongue, continual slanders ride, the which in every language I pronounce. Slanders. Okay, now slanders aren't accidental. When you slander somebody, in order for it to be proven slander in a court of law, what has to lie behind the slander? Malicious intent. You intend to harm somebody's reputation. Okay? Which is why it is almost impossible to convict somebody of slander against somebody who is famous. <laughs> because the person who is famous, the person whose name is always in the news, all kinds of things are said. About, and you could just go, well, I didn't maliciously intend it. I heard it. I didn't know. I, I'm not trying to harm this person's reputation, etc. Stuffing the ears of men with... Replace false reports with a modern phrase. Fake news. Fake news. That's exactly what that is. Fake news. I speak of peace while covert enmity under the smile of safety wounds the world. And who but rumor, who but only I make fearful musters and prepare defense whilst the big year, that is the year's almost over, swollen with some other grief, is thought with child by the stern tyrant war, and no such matter. No such matter. That's not the case. Rumor is a pipe 
blown by surmises, jealousies, conjectures. Notice, these are the things that fill rumor. Surmises, jealousies, conjectures, and of so easy and so plain a stop that the blunt monster with uncounted heads, like the hydra, the still discordant, not the marvel, but the old Greek hydra, still discordant waving multitude can play upon it. But what I need thus my well-known body to anatomize among my household. Who is my household? All of you. That's what rumor is saying. Anyone who passes on something that they don't know to be fact or true, guess what? You are rumor. Not what you tell, not what you tell, but you are the embodiment of rumor by passing along something you don't know necessarily to be true. Why is rumor here? Here. Here where? In front of Northumberland's house. Louder? Northumberland doesn't know how his son died. Northumberland doesn't know that his son is dead. He for all he knows, Harry Percy is kicking and Harry, Prince of Wales, is dead. So, why is rumor here? I run before King Harry's victory. Meaning, I am going before the not false report, but true report of Harry's victory is spread. To do what? who in a bloody field by Shrewsbury hath beaten down young Hotspur and his troops, quenching the flame of bold rebellion, even with rebel's blood. I'm coming before the truth to spread falsehood, to build up hopes. My office, but what I mean to speak so true at first, my office is to noise abroad that Harry Monmouth fell under the wrath of noble Hotspur's sword. How, how often in the last 20 years, let's say, has something been quote-unquote reported as true and then we find out it's almost the exact opposite? In that the king before the Douglas's rage stooped his anointed head as low as death. So what happens once Northumberland learns? Hotspur's alive, Hal is dead, Douglas is alive, the king is dead. What's Northumberland going to think once he hears that? We won. <laughs> this have I rumored through the peasant towns, between that royal field of Shrewsbury and this worm-eaten hold of a ragged stone. Where Hotspur's father, old Northumberland, lies crafty sick. Crafty sick. The gloss tells you, feigning sickness. Were we told in the previous play that when they received word, old Northumberland is sick, that he was crafty sick, that he was faking it? So why didn't he show up? Why did he leave his son, sorry, why did he hang his son out to slaughter? Huh. Bardolph comes in. Not the same Bardolph who Hal hangs around with false stuff and stuff at the tavern. Okay? So Bardolph comes in, and what does he tell Northumberland? Line 13. News as good as heart can wish. The king is almost wounded to the death, and in the fortune of my lord your son, Prince Harry, slain outright. Notice, Bardolph wasn't there. This is rumor being spread. And both the blunts killed by the hand of Douglas, young Prince John and Westmoreland and Stafford, fled the field. Harry Monmouth Braun, the, sulk, the Hulk Sir John, is prisoner to your son. How is this derived? Okay. 
Look at your gloss. What's your source? Prove it. How is this news obtained? What's Northumberland asking for? Proof. Solid proof. When we get to Othello, Othello is going to say to Iago, when Iago kind of tells Othello, your, your wife's cheating on you. He says, give me the ocular proof. Unless I see it with my own eyes. Saw you the field? Notice, with your own eyes, did you see Harry Monmouth dead on the ground? Did you see the king crawling away, mostly dead? Came you from Shrewsbury? Well, I spoke with one. He spoke with one, and a court of law means that becomes what? Hearsay. Hearsay is not admissible in a court of law. It is in only a couple of instances. Like if you speak to your doctor. Your doctor can give testimony that's not considered hearsay. Why? Because it's thought, if you're speaking to your doctor or shrink, that you're not lying to your doctor or shrink. But if you are a particularly conniving bastard, you might be lying to your doctor or shrink. The reason I say that is because the character Iago, he's that kind of conniving bastard. Or the character of Edmund in King Lear, right? He, they both tell us up front the kind of people they are. We're thoroughly rotten SOBs. We love to do evil, right? Kind of a thing. So, I spoke with one, my lord, that came from thence, a gentleman well-bred, of good name, okay? That freely rendered, notice we're not given a name, so, Travers then comes in. So, Bardolph comes in, and he buoys up Northumberland's spirits. Travers. And Northumberland says, oh, look, here comes Travers, Bardolph. I overrode him on the way. I passed him up. He's furnished with no certainties more than he happily may retail. He doesn't know more than I do. Travers comes in and says, uh, let's see, where do I want to pick up? 39. He asked of Sir John Umfreville, and of him I did demand what news from Shrewsbury. He told me that rebellion had bad luck and that young Percy Spur was cold. Hot Spurs no longer hot. And with that, he gave his affable horse the head, bending forward, struck his arm, arm and heels against the panting sides of his poor jade, up to the rail head, starting so he seemed and running to devour the way. Why does he give us this little description of old Sir John Umfreville trying to outride Travers? Is he trying to outride Travers towards Northumberland? Trying to outright him where? To get as far from Shrewsbury as possible. Why? The rebel's lost. He's hightailing it out of there. So, now Northumberland has to do what? I've got two claims. Notice, they are opposing. They are competing claims. Whose claim is true? Because Bartle says, I had it directly from somebody who was there. Trevor says, I had it directly from somebody who was there. Again, Shakespeare is always relevant. <laughs> said he, young Harry's Pers Percy Spur was cold? Of hot spur? Cold spur? Rebellion had met ill luck? Bartolf. If my young lord, your son, have not the day upon mine honor for a silken point, I'll give my barony. Give my barony means I'll give up all my land. Don't worry about it. Never talk on it. 
why should that gentleman that rode by Travers then give such instances a loss? In other words, why should he lie? What benefit would he get from it? Don't worry about him. He was probably some hiding fellow that had stolen the horse he rode on. And look, my life spoke at a venture. That is, just threw it out there like rumor. Here comes more news. In comes Morton. This man's brow like to a title leaf. What's he mean, title leaf? Title page of a book. Right? Like to a title leaf foretells the nature of a tragic volume. Why? Because what would that volume of tragedies have on the title page? It would have images of frowning faces. Like when Shakespeare at the Globe, when the Globe would put on a tragedy, it would have up the, I always get these confused, the buskin, which is a flag with an image of a mask on it with a frown. And if it were a comedy, it would have what's called the socks on. That told people in London who are milling around what kind of performance was going to put on, be put on that day? A tragedy or comedy, okay? I don't know what they did for histories. Keep in mind, many of the histories, some of the histories, are the tragedy of King Richard II, even though it's considered a history, or the tragedy of King Richard III. So, so looks the strand whereon the imperious flood hath left a witnessed usurpation. Morton, I ran from Shrewsbury, my good lord, noble lord, where hateful death put on its ugliest mask to fright our party. In other words, he doesn't mean necessarily, literally ran on his two feet. I come from Shrewsbury. In other words, I was there. I saw it with my own two eyes. So, two uncontested, unproven reports. Because neither of those people saw it with their own eyes. Now, this would be a corroborating witness, if you want. How doth my son and brother? Northumberland wants to know. Thou tremblest in the whiteness in thy cheek. Notice Shakespeare's subtle stage direction there. He's telling us what Morton should be doing as Northumberland speaks. His hands should be shaking. His lips should be quivering. He's not sure how to brook this news. And the whiteness in thy cheek is apter than thy tongue to tell thy errand. Even such a man, so faint, so spiritless, so dull, so dead, and looked so woebegone, drew Prime's curtain in the dead of night and would have told him half his Troy was burnt. But in the end, to stop my ear indeed, thou hast a sigh to blow away this praise, ending with... Brother, son, and all are dead. Morton. Douglas is living? That's good news, right? Yay, Douglas. <laughs> but for my lord, your son? Dash. What's the dash? Interruption? Pause. He doesn't finish. Northumberland does. Why, he is dead. See what a ready tongue suspicion hath. I thought so. The suspicion began when? When Bardolph came in? I don't think so. I think the reason Northumberland feigns sickness is he knows exactly how this is going to play out. He that but fears the thing he would not know, fears the thing he what? He doesn't want proof of. Hath by instinct knowledge from others' eyes that what he feared is chanced. Gloss has occurred. 
Notice, I, I don't really want to know. I don't really want to ask, but your face tells me everything. Speak, Morton. Tell thou an earl his divination lies. His divination, what his soul told him to be true. Tell me, tell me I'm wrong. You are too great to be, to be by me gainsaid. <laughs> Nope, can't oppose. Yea, yet for all this, say not that Percy's dead. I, I see a strange confession in thine eye. It's like Lear, when Lear thinks, ooh, Cordelia's not really all the way dead. Do you, you see that? Do you see that little wisp on the mirror? Maybe she's really... Thou shakes thy head. Because he says, I see a strange confession in thine eye. He's grasping at straws. Why? This is a father talking about his son. Don't want to know my son's dead. This is like a parent standing at a doorway as a cop stands there to tell you. Your son's been killed in a car. No, no, no. Maybe it was somebody else. You know. Thou shakes thy head and holdst it fear or sin to speak a truth. If he be slain, say so. What does Northumberland need? He has to hear it. He has to hear it. Harry, Percy, Hotspur, son of Northumberland, is dead. Bardolph, I, have to, I can't believe your son is dead. I am sorry I should force you to believe. In other words, believe it. That which I would to God I had not seen. Would, wished to God. But these mine eyes saw him in bloody state. I saw it with my own two eyes. Rendering faint quittance, wearied and outbreathed to Harry Monmouth, whose swift wrath beat down the never daunted Percy to the earth. Never daunted means never defeated. Previously, Harry Percy was 100, 100 and 0. 100 battles, zero losses. Yeah, well, the one loss is the kicker. From whence with life he never more sprung up. In view his death, whose spirit lent a fire even the dullest peasant in his camp, being brooded once, took fire and heat away from the best tempered courage in his roots. When the troops of the rebels saw Hotspur killed, what happened to their will? They didn't want to go on anymore. They didn't want to go on anymore. For from his metal was, was his party steeled, which once in him abated, all the rest turned on themselves like dull and heavy lead. Doesn't mean they turned against each other. It means they turned to leave. Skip a little bit. Then was that noble Worcester too soon taken prisoner and that fury Scott, the bloody Douglas, whose well-laboring sword had three times slain the appearance of the king. Can veil his stomach did grace the shame of those that turned their backs and in his light stumbling and fear was took. The sum of all, that is, to make my story short, the king hath won, and the sin out a speedy power to encounter you, my lord, under the conduct of young Lancaster and Westmoreland. The and Westmoreland is important because young Lancaster, like I said, is mid to late teens. He's not that fear fearsome. Old Westmoreland, however, is. He's been around a while. So, he says, okay, I'll grieve my son later. Now, 144, excuse me, 145, and 144. Weakened with grief, being now enraged with grief, are thrice themselves. Hence, therefore, thou nice crutch. He throws away his crutch. Why? He doesn't need it. The scaly gauntlet now with joints of steel must glove this hand, and hence thou sick, and he takes off his cap. Now, skipping a few more lines, let not nature's hand keep the wild flood confined. What's the wild flood? Where is the wild flood? 
It's a flood of what? Anger, passion, rage. What does Inigo Montoya say to the six-fingered man? You killed my father, prepare to die. This is Northumberland saying, you killed my son, prepare to die. And let this world no longer be a stage to feed contention in a lingering act. Lingering implies taking time. Let's not while away the time in this kind of slow-acting rebellion. He wants to do what? Blow it all to hell. Just hit them. Hit them hard. But let one spirit of the firstborn Cain reign in all bosoms. Well, what spirit is that? He killed his brother, fratricide. What's he talking about? Civil war. That each heart being set on bloody courses, the rude scene may end in darkness, be the barrier of the dead. Okay, so what's happened in Northumberland's mind? Does he care if he lives? Does he care if anybody lives? No, he doesn't. This strained passion doth you wrong. Okay? Strained, excessive. Morton. Shh. Sweet Earl, divorce not wisdom from your honor. In other words, don't act solely out of passion. Whenever passion is ungoverned by the mind, Bad things happen. The lives of all your loving accomplices lean on your health. Notice that. All your people, your accomplices, your supporters, they what? They lean on your health means what? They rely on you. And what he's getting at is... You know, it's one thing to throw away your life. It's another thing to be a false stuff and to throw away all your men's lives. They lean on your health, though which, if you give over to stormy passion, must perforce decay. So, he's saying, if you give in to this passion, you and all your men's lives, they will decay. It was your pre-surmise that in the dole of blows your son might drop. Your, <clears throat> you got to love Shakespeare's use of language. Because we would say surmise means what? If you surmise something, you don't know it, but you expect it. You think it. Your pre means you're before surmising. You thought your son was going to lose this battle. And therefore you did what? He stayed away, which meant what for your son? Well, that made it even more likely that your son was going to lose that battle. You knew he walked over perils on an edge, more likely to fall in than to get over. You were advised his flesh was capable of wounds and scars, and that his forward spirit would lift him where most trade of danger ranged, and yet you said, go on, boy, go get him. You can do it. Now, this is Morton showing what kind of attitude towards his lord. Not very respectful. This is kind of like saying, he's dead because of you. You egged him on in this battle and didn't what? Support him. You didn't back him up. Bardolph, well, well, I mean, we knew that this was a possibility. Okay. Skip a bit. Pick up with, um, do we want to go there? 
Yeah, one, two. We have Falstaff with his page, and the Chief Justice comes in. This isn't Chief Justice like John Roberts, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. This is like the head law enforcement officer, okay? And he's been sent there by the king to kind of rule in, reign in Falstaff, okay? He says, um, let's pick up around 135. The truth is, Sir John, you live in great infamy. Well, he that buckles himself in my belt cannot live less. Um, your means are very slender. Your waste is great. That is, you have little income, and yet you spend prolifically. Though Shakespeare is plenty there on the word waste, because he's this big fat slob. I would it were otherwise. I would my means were greater. I had more income, and I would, you know more fit, etc. You have misled the youthful prince. Ah, now the chief justice is getting to his point. The young prince hath misled me. I am the fellow with the great bellow, belly, he my dog. I am loath to call a new healed wound. Your day service at Shrewsbury, that is, the little bit you were involved at the Battle of Shrewsbury, what? Hath gilded over your knight's exploit at Gad's Hill. I know you were the robber. We're not going to talk about that because of what you did at Shrewsbury. Well, what did he do at Shrewsbury? According to the Chief Justice. What's the Chief Justice think he did at Shrewsbury? Killed Hotspur. He killed Hotspur. And that's a pretty glorious thing, so we're not going to count this little misdemeanor robbery. Okay? So... He says, 163, you follow the young prince up and down like his ill angel. How many of you remember, maybe you never watched them. If you didn't, then you've had a poor childhood. How many of you remember the old Warner Brothers cartoons? And you'd have Bugs Bunny, and Bugs Bunny would be thinking of something to do, and suddenly on one shoulder would appear a little angel with a halo. <coughs> on the other side, the guy with the pitchfork. <coughs> That's his ill angel. You are Hal's. Demonic attendant. He says, not so. Your ill angel is light. Why? Because Peter says, angels can appear as a being of light. But I hope he that looks upon me, you know, I'm not light by any means. Virtues of so little regard in these costermongers' times that true valor is turned bitterward. Pregnancy is made a tapster and is quick wit wasted in giving reckonings. So, Chief Justice, and he go on. And finally, the Chief Justice says, about right around 200, the king hath severed you and Prince Harry. You will have no more contact with Hal. I hear you are going with Lord John of Lancaster against the Archbishop. And there, yeah, I am. So what's he going to have to do? Because he no longer has troops to lead. He's got to round up another 150 pieces of cannon fodder, okay? One, three. We're back with the rebels. This is a different Thomas Mowbray, by the way, because that one's dead already. And let's see here. They're talking about their, their plotting. 27, Bardolph says, um, trying to think how to introduce the speech. He's saying, we don't really have much hope without Hotspur. It was my lord who lined himself, the who is Hotspur, who lined himself with hope, eating the air on promise of supply, flattering himself with project of a power much smaller than the smallest of his thoughts, and so with great imagination, proper to madmen, led his powers to death, in winking, leapt into destruction. In other words, Hotspur fought on the basis of what? Hope. Hope. Okay? Not numbers. He didn't have the numbers to win. So, 
Hastings says, it never yet did hurt to lay down likelihoods and forms of hope. That is, to take your likelihoods, your forms of hope, pull out a yellow legal pad, pros and cons. So Bardolph goes on, and he gives us another image. You know, when men get ready to build a house, what do they do? 41. When we mean to build, we first survey the plot. Then draw the model, and when we see the figure of the house, then must we rate the cost of the erection, which if we find out lays ability, what must you do? Well, you redraw the model, and you do what? I don't need five bedrooms. I can get by with four. I don't need three bathrooms. I can. We shrink it down on the basis of what? How much money you actually have. Okay? Much more in this great work, that is this rebellion, which is almost to pluck a kingdom down and set another up, should we survey the plot of situation and the model, consent upon a sure foundation. What's the foundation? How many troops do we have? What are our actual forces? Question surveyors know our own estate. How able such a work to undergo, to weigh against his opposite, or we fortify in paper and in figures using the names of men instead of are we merely putting out, well, we think we have such and such on our side? Bardolph's getting at what? Can we actually win this thing? I mean, is this doable? Do we have the forces? Hastings, I think we are a body strong enough, even as we are, to equal with the king. What should Bardolph say there? Or what could Bardolph say there? Yeah, so did Hotspur. No, what's the king but five and 20,000? Doesn't matter. For his decisions, his divisions are in three heads. In other words, the king's power is divided. No, united we stand, divided we fall. His powers are divided, so we take out one. And we take out another. All right, we'll pick up there on Tuesday. Um, yeah, I'll let you know Tuesday. If we finish Tuesday, then we'll have an exam next Thursday. If we don't have, if we don't finish Tuesday, and we finish next Thursday, then we'll have a take-home exam.